So we're getting ready to start a new series today. Uh, it, it's a water-themed series. That's why I wore my turtle shirt today. Uh, so, you know, for the rest of the month, we're going to be uh, having a water theme going on. At the end of the month, on, on Labor Day weekend, is when the whole series is going to conclude. And uh, we're going to have a baptism service and uh, maybe a, a church picnic, that kind of thing. So kind of save that date. Um, the details are still being uh, refined. So um, all of you have a water story, right? All of you have a water story, a time where uh, you became aware of water, where you became aware of the, the power of water. I, I, I've, I love watching reels. It's driving my wife nuts that I, I'm like, you ought to see this reel. And reels are, are little short videos, okay? And, and, and they, they'll pop up on my Facebook feed, and they're just goofy things sometimes. One of them I love to watch is when they take a, a, a stream of water, and they've got it so forceful that it can cut through like a bar of steel. And there's no waste product. It just, and, and that just boggles my mind. You know, how did that cut? And there's no like, you know, residue. It just cut right through. I, I remember when I was a kid and, and went to the car wash, the, you know, and you put the money, the quarters in. And I just wanted to know how powerful it was. So I stuck my thumb over the end of it. And, only did it once. I, I didn't need to do it anymore after that. Water is a powerful force. I, I know, um, well, if you ever get the chance, and if you haven't, do yourself a favor. Go see Niagara Falls. Um, it is breathtaking. And you stand there on the edge of the falls, and you're like, oh, my goodness. The power the power that is unleashed at that. Uh, water can be used to generate power, like electricity and energy as it turns turbines and, and the like. Elena and Merritt just went uh, whitewater rafting and the power, you, you took the, the placid cruise, didn't you? You didn't take the, the like thrill you're seeing in the front chair of the uh, roller coaster one. I, I, I've done that. There, that's a fun thing to do too. If you never have had that opportunity, Go whitewater rafting like at the New River or the uh, something like that. That's, that's a great place to go. And uh, make sure your life insurance is paid up and, and that kind of thing. But the power of that river is, is something to behold. They, they tell you as you're driving there that every year somebody dies on the river, which is just encouraging. And, uh, but the power of, of, of that water and you all have stories about water. Um, you have stories where water has brought uh, a kind of a, a sense of peacefulness and well-being. Uh, Tammy Taylor, uh, as soon as the week's over for her, she can't wait to get to her lake cottage and be on the water. And if you ever look at her Facebook post, she and Risa are sitting on a boat in the water because it's therapeutic, it's refreshing, it's renewing, it's, there's something about the water. I know one of the things that I have to do on a regular basis, at least once a year, is to take my wife to Lake Michigan. Okay? And, and one of the things that's fascinating to me, you go to Lake Michigan and you can start to see the curvature of the earth. It's just a massive, massive body of water. You got stories where water has been alarming. Uh, we got people that uh, we've had to make sure that we're doing well in Kentucky because of the flash floods and water can be a, a, a dangerous and, and troubling thing but water can also be refreshing and, and, and renewing and encouraging when I was in scouts not too far away we went to Camp Crosley okay you know where I'm talking and, and I got my mile swim badge Okay, and oh, I was so thrilled that I was out there and I had conquered the water. But then later that summer, we went canoeing with the scout troop and the boat, the canoe tipped over and I started heading downstream and my belt loop got hooked on a submerged tree and I lost my ever-loving mind because I thought, not only was I going to drown, but the water moccasins were going to feast upon me. Water. 
I want you to take a moment now and, and talk to the person near you and tell them a, a, a water story, something that popped into your mind when I started sharing about water. Where do you go? What does it do in your head when you start thinking about water? Hopefully it's not about your water bill, but what are you reminded of as a water story? So take a moment and, and share with the, somebody around you. You grew up on a lake, eh? There's a good water story. So hear the word of the Lord, Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. And yet their voice goes out into the, all the earth. Their words to the end of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of his bridal chamber, like a champion running and rejoicing over the course completed. It rises at one end of the heavens, and it makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. Well, today we're going to look at the waters of creation specifically. If you have a Bible with you, I want you to uh, turn to Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. Now, you guys all know this. You ready? Uh, you, can, you can complete it. I, I know this. In the beginning. Good job. Janie's still going. Okay. <laughs> In the beginning, who, who did this? God. And what did he do? created the the latin derivative here is called ex nihilo that god created all out of nothing none of you can do that you have to have some kind of raw material to do creating okay but everyone in this room have creative urges, creative things that you think of. All of you, at one time or another, were creative. And then probably somewhere along the line, somebody stomped the creativity out of a lot of you, especially we males. That's why guys go out to their shops to tinker. Did you know that? Because creativity is stirring. They, they want to create something. Because they carry and bear the image of God. We all carry and bury, bear the image of God on our lives. And we're going to see that here in this Genesis account. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless. It was empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, God said, do, do you understand what just happened? It's the first time in recorded history that God is going to speak. And when God speaks, something happens. What wasn't now is. He speaks it into being. He created it by the power of his word. 
You understand that we see the Trinity functioning in here, right? I, I hope you understand that. We, we, the, the word that in, in John chapter 1, we see in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. In the message version, it gets down there into about verse 6 or so, and it says, and God became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. This creator God, he's personal, he's intimate, he's present. He does not create and then step away and say, that was cool. No, no, he moves in with creation. He begins to dwell in the midst of creation. He's personally invested and connected to creation. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. And so he begins this, cre so he speaks it into being, and then he adjusts it, he shapes it, he forms it, he moves it around to find how it needs to be. Now I want you to keep this in mind, okay? I want you to keep this in mind. All of you who ever brought a baby home, all of you who ever brought a baby home, before you brought the baby home, you did some work, right? You got the place prepared for the baby to thrive, not just exist. And you spent an inordinate amount of money on things. And I want to know something for any of you. Please tell me, how many of you, your infant child who then grew into a toddler, Anywhere along the process, anywhere along the process, did any of you ever have your child say, you know, I just want to thank you. I, I know that that was a major commitment on your part. You spent your money, your hard-earned money. You took your time. You reallocated space. You did everything in order for me to succeed. And I just want to thank you. Didn't happen, did it? You think maybe the God of all creation wonders that sometimes? Like, I made this for you. I, I got uncomfortable for you. I rearranged my, my agenda so that you could be successful. And you guys all know this. You know, you... You do all these things to try to get your kids to be successful, and then, you know, they, all of a sudden, they're sticking beans up their nose. And you're like, what? What? I thought I raised you better than that. I told you when I left the house, you can do anything you want to, but don't put beans up your nose. And as soon as you walk out the door, what do they do? Where's the beans? And so the God of all creation, he has this wonderful thing he wants to accomplish in us. He made us to worship him. Not to worship his creation, but to worship him. And this whole narrative, uh, you need to understand something. Every ancient Near Eastern society, the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, the Assyrians, they all had creation narratives. All of them did. There's something radically different about this creation narrative. In these other traditions, these other creation narratives, creation was the outcropping of conflict. Okay? So they had a fight, the gods, little g, had a fight, and in one particular narrative, this fight gets very bloody, very carnal, and they rip one of the gods in half, and they throw one half up into the sky, and they throw other half down and one becomes then one half becomes the sky and the other becomes the earth you look at the biblical narrative and it doesn't flow out of conflict it flows out of love it flows out of joy it flows out of celebration it flows out of the heart and nature of this good god who loves to create god loves his job I don't know if you understand that. God loves his job. Do you? Do you love your job? Would you do your job for free? Do you find at the end of the day that you're excited about what you were able to get accomplished? You see, work, 
was and continues to be a part of the gig. From the time of creation, God made this and he says to, well, there's the Adamses. Adam and Eve. Eve hasn't been named yet until after the fall. He, he tells them, basically, you got a job now. I've modeled for you what your job is. I, I, I've done this, but I want you to now take on the capacity, the, the goal, the desires that I have. I've created you in my image. You have a, an innate desire to be creative. Now, go into it. And part of what I want you to do is you get to name these things. You remember that? Now, who started naming things? God did. He called the sun. He called the other thing the moon. He called the stuff up there, the sky. He called the place down there, the earth. He, he, he starts naming things. Now, Adam's observing later on these things. He, he knows innately that this creator God has called him into partnership for subduing and caretaking over creation. What a wonderful thing. We've been invited to be a part of what God's up to. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made a vault that separated the water under the vault and water above and and so it was there, and God called the vault the sky, and there was the evening, and there was the morning of the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground land, and he gathered all the waters together, and he called them the seas, and God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seeds in it, and according to the various kinds, and it was so. And the land produced vegetation, plants bearing seeds, according to their kinds, and tree bearing fruit with seeds in it, and according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was the evening, and there was the morning of the third day. And then God said, that there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night, let them serve as a sign to mark sacred times and days and years and let them be the lights in the vault of the sky to give light to the earth. And it was so. And God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. And God set them in the vault on the sky and gave light on the earth to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was the evening and there was the morning of the fourth day. God's putting in a good week. I mean, there's a lot of things going on. Now, you, you see there on the fourth day, what didn't exist until the fourth day was this thing called time. And when God gives this concept, because there wasn't, you know, a, a passage of time, God gives this or an understanding of passage of time. How about that? And God gives this thing called days and nights and seasons and years. and All that gets created there in the fourth day. Now, if you remember in the video, the video does a great job of saying it's not really relevant. It's not the thing to argue about whether or not it is seven literal days. That's not the point of this. You can, you can get the ball lost in the tall grass, and you can go out there and hunt for it, and you can hunt and hunt and hunt. That's not what this is about. This is poetry, and this is saying, well, one commentator that I read, and I'd never heard this before, says, okay, first of all, who wrote this book down? Thank you. Moses. Well, how did Moses, he wasn't there when all this was transpired. How did Moses know what to write down? God told him, okay, here's what one commentator said. I just thought it was fascinating because I had never, never encountered this particular thought process. That when Moses went up Mount Sinai, remember that? And he gets the Ten Commandments ultimately and all that kind of stuff. That God says, hey, hey, before we get to the business about the Ten Commandments, I want to show you something. And so he takes him over and, he, and Moses looks and he sees this vista of eternity. 
And he sees what God's up to. And God says, hey, look, I want you to see it. That's day number one. What do you think? <gasps> wow. Here, okay, look over here. <gasps> That's day number two. And so Moses gets this God's eye view of what God did in the creative process. Another thought was uh, that it's just a, a kind of a turn of a phrase that, okay, um, we've all said this, anybody my age and up. Back in my day, now is back in my day a 24-hour time period? No, it's not. Back in my day, there was this place called McDonald's, and they'd say they had this commercial, and you got change back from your dollar. Did you know that? You used to be able to go, you'd go get a hamburger fry and a Coke, and you'd get change back from your one dollar. Remember that, yeah. Back in my day. That's a long time ago, yes. Back in my day, gas used to be 50 cents a gallon. Back in my day. <laughs> Carl, you're older than I am. Okay. So, so that's the understanding. It's not about an argument about how long or how short this time period was. That's, you're, you're missing the point. The point is there's a creator who is worthy of praise. There's a creator and he, and he alone is worthy of our praise. In fact, Psalm 90 verse 4 says, one day is like a thousand years to God and a thousand years is like a day to God. So the focus of this whole narrative here in Genesis is that God is a creating God and he has given his pinnacle of, 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 of creation to us, his children. We bear his image. He, he called us into being. You know, the, okay, what was the first human's name? Adam. If you looked in the original language, the word Adam means dust. So he's dusty. Here's Dusty. Hey, Dusty. And at the end of when the fall happens, what does God say? You came from the dust, and to the dust you will return, Dusty. So this God of all creation, why did he do this? Well, he did it out of a heart for love. He loves us and wants us to be able to celebrate the gift of his creation. We're not supposed to worship creation. We're never. That's called idolatry. That's pagan idolatry. We're called to then attune our attentions, our devotion, our love, our worship to this wonderful creator God. He and he alone is worthy of our praise, of our worship. Now, if you see this whole narrative, I'm, I'm going to not read the rest of, of the creation narrative. I want you to read it today sometime. But you're going to see that there is something radically different, once again, in the biblical creation narrative compared to the pagan creation narratives. There is direction and process. There's a beginning and there's an end. God speaks and he brings order into the chaos. And some of you, your lives right now, feel like that they are filled with nothing but chaos. Everything's out of control. Everything's just topsy-turvy. Everything's, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. And, and I want to challenge you with this. To let the word of the Lord penetrate the chaos of your life and let him speak peace back into you and bring order to your chaos. He can and he will and he's there. And so God speaking order into the chaos of creation, that word is timeless and true for the chaos in our lives in this day and age. The beginning and the end, Revelation chapter 4, 
around the, uh, the throne in the cosmos, God's heavenly throne, the angelic beings and the saints who have gone on to glory are gathered there in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. And it says, you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and for your pleasure they were created and exist. You see, that, that's worship. And we get the privilege and the joy to be on the receiving end of God's creative process. It's a gift. I got up this morning, and Carl, you think you're not a morning person. I'm not either, but on Sunday mornings, I'm always up about 5.30 in the morning, and I went out. Anybody else up at about 5.30 on Sunday morning? Did you see the sunrise? It was magnificent. It was just glorious. And I looked across the field, and there was this little haze on the field over there, and I'm colorblind, but my goodness, God's best work was being done painted panoramically in the sky. And I stopped and I gave thanks to God for the gift of his creation. He didn't have to do it, but he did because he loves me. And he said, Rob, I want you to see this. Stop for a second and look what I did. My goodness. God's not like us in terms of, you know, when your kid brings something home and you like, and they go, I, I, I colored this today. And you're like, that's awesome when, when they first do it. But then you get to the place, maybe you don't, but I get to the place like, okay, we're out of room on the refrigerator. And thank you. Yes, that's great. File 13. No, you, you guys probably never threw your kid's stuff away. In fact, you still have it because it was so awesome. I remember making a, a shoe, took a woman's dress shoe and glued macaroni on it, stuffed clay in it, and stuck flowers in it for Mother's Day. And my mom kept it for the love of donuts. I mean, what in the world? But her little boy had made it. Our God's not like that. He's like, oh, that's awesome. You know, you, you, you just blessed me. You know why you can do that? Because you're doing like your dad did. What a joy. Thank you for giving me that. I'm going to put that on the cosmic refrigerator because I'm so proud of you. This God of all creation loves us and celebrates the the things that we do to help us fulfill our destiny and our kingdom calling. He thought of everything. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? Praise God from whom blessings flow. Praise him here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Now that should be sung like a fight song. We're taking this hill. We're so excited about the gift of this day that this good God has given us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad? He gave us the gift of this day. And instead of being Eeyore, oh bother, lost my tail. Didn't see my name in the paper. Guess it's going to be a good day. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. This good God created us and gave us this gift of his creation. And then he invites us into the process to be caretakers and stewards of his creation. What a, what a good God. What a good God he is. We're going to do a responsive reading right now. It's uh, found in Psalm 136, verses 1 through 9. 
Okay, so I'm going to read the first part, and you guys are going to say, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Give thanks to the, to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To Him who alone does great wonders. Who by his understanding made the heavens. Who spread out the earth upon the waters. Who made the great lights. The sun to govern the day. The moon and the stars to govern the night. The moon and stars to govern the night. Is is that the last line of it? Oh, thanks. Okay. His love endures forever. Let's pray. 